Welcome to 85's Commando Film Review and Thoughts. Now, I start this video with a review with no spoilers, but as soon as I try that again, but as soon as I end the review itself, please note that the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And yeah, I am aware that many people have watched this movie. This review will still be based on the idea that the person watching hasn't. So the yeah, the plot is that a former yeah, a former special forces soldier when his you know, former squad mates are killed and his daughter Jenny is kidnapped, John Matrix is forced out of retirement. The movie moves fairly quickly and manages to cram in a ton of action. It's honestly very impressive just how much of the running time is devoted to action. And I realize some of the critics thought that was a bad thing, and I, the movie was not made for people who think that it's a bad thing for the movie to mostly be action. Now, the opening really grabs your attention. You know, it starts with the various assassinations of the former squad mates and then the kidnapping. And the movie does a good job of establishing from right away that these guys know what they're doing. You know, the bad guys are not new at this. And the ending is huge in a very satisfying climax. And the movie never stalls along the way, which I know a lot of action movies where, you know, around the middle, it's like, okay, can we move along? You know, like, there's, there's filler. Because if most of your action movie is action, it's difficult to make all of it matter. It can, you know, some, some of it will often be filler, but here, like, I defy you, find me one scene in this movie that doesn't change the status quo or forward the plot in some way. And as far as characterization goes, you know, the, the, it's not the most character, you know, heavily characterized movie. Yeah, um, that's what I'm going with. But, you know, the, the, there are some very no, noteworthy bits of characterization. Radon Chong plays a stewardess, Cindy, who John encounters, and she has a lot of personality, and she's very active in the plot. She gets to tell people off when they treat her badly, as well as comment on some of the ridiculous stuff that happens. You know, a lot of people don't think very highly of stewardesses, and this movie helps challenge that kind of thinking. And Jenny manages to evoke a lot of sympathy from the audience without coming across as completely helpless. She could very easily come across as just a victim. There are not that many female characters in this movie, but they took care to make each of them have personality and not come across as weak. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with... You know, if this sort of thing, if something similar to this happened in real life, it would be completely understandable if you weren't, like, super strong throughout. But this movie is not trying to come across like real life. It is a power fantasy, and a lot of power fantasies really don't take care of to make the women be more than victims. The villains do have a little bit of personality as well, and... In fact, every single goon gets to have at least some character, gets a few lines, or like, you know, there there are like reaction shots. Like like one of the one of the bad guys will say something really despicable, and then I'll cut to one of the goons. It'll be like, yeah, that's right, that's right, you know, and that makes the comeuppance that much more enjoyable. Ultimately, Arnold's character doesn't have that much personality, which is too bad because we've seen that he can do great character acting under the right circumstances. You know, among other things, he does incredible when playing a Terminator, which I know some people say, ah, oh, you know, he just has to act without emotion, that's easy. Actually try it. Try, like, filming yourself acting like you have no emotion. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to, to make it seem as though, you know, 
and there are some other like there there are some of his movies where it comes across as like he really has a heart and some of the time he does in this as well but a lot of the time he's basically this one note tough badass who's single mindedly focused on mission but you know when he's with Jenny he's a very sweet loving father who isn't afraid to show affection you know the the there are a lot of 80s movies where men are, you know, have to be manly all the time and aren't, show, you know, in general, it's, it's really unfortunate that our culture has this, per, there's this perception that showing affection for your loved ones isn't manly, but, you know, it's, it's not masculine, and, and, yeah, but the, the, yeah, you know, they, they come across as really loving each other. And when it comes to Cindy the stewardess, you know, he's like, he's firm, but he is willing to respect that she isn't used to this sort of thing. You know, the, the, like there's, there's, there's at least one time where there's a situation where she could have gotten hurt. And he straight up asks, are you okay? You know, the, the, he, he takes a, a brief moment to, to make sure that she is all right. When, you know, ultimately, you know, it wouldn't be a huge surprise if he didn't care that much about her. Because he really isn't, you know, yeah. But he, he clearly is, you know, he doesn't want her to get hurt. He does care about that sort of thing. You know, the movie gets across that, you know, when it comes to bad guys, he's vicious. But when dealing with regular people, you know, he tries to be a good person. There are a few exceptions, but I'm not going to give those away. And some of the antagonist characters can be just deliciously evil. And Bill Duke is very memorable in, in this. You know, I... I... I don't think I've seen Bill Duke not be really memorable, although, you know, there are movies that don't make much, you know, that, that really don't give him much to do, like X-Men The Last Stand, for example. Now, there are a lot of action movies that use the trope of an incredible military person being forced out of retirement to do one last job for a personal reason. I would say that this is one of the very best of them. And the cinematography, it's not, like, amazing, but they make sure that you you can always follow the action scenes, which <laughs> today is not always a given. And the editing is quite good, keeps the pace quick. Now, there are a few times where it's very obvious that you know, something is a special effect, but a lot of the time, the special effects are subtle and integrated well. And I would say there's the right amount of special effects. And there are a lot of stunts, and they are all excellent. And I think it works very well in the movie that a lot of the time, John has to keep his presence hidden, so he's very stealthy, quick, and effective. And the music is tense and suspenseful, and it's very big and loud. You know, it's James Horner, and he can, he, yeah, sometimes his scores are, are like that. And it works incredibly well. I think I saw at least some people criticize the score. I don't understand that. I think it, it fits perfectly for the movie. Like, Okay, let's say that the same score was used for The Terminator, another Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, came out one year before this. Then I would say it doesn't fit the tone at all. But for this, it fit, you know, and vice versa, I wouldn't want the Terminator score for this movie. I, I think it is, yeah, it's it's big and loud. It's, the movie is about, a, I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger is basically just a huge mass of muscles. 
and the movie consists of him going around, you know, beating people up and shooting. It, it makes sense for it to be being allowed. And overall, it is a fairly straightforward 1980s one-man army action flick, but it's definitely a strong entry. Now... This movie can be compared to First Blood Part Two. Now, Renegade Cut does a great job talking about American movies in the Vietnam War, so I won't get into that aspect or spend very long time talking about how that movie would have been infinitely better if it wasn't a purely boneheaded sequel to a movie that was very honest and empathetic to PTSD. It's enjoyable to watch for sure, but boy, is it a step down from the first one. I'd I'd be saying the same thing about this movie if this was actually the, the sequel to First Blood, but if we are talking purely about how entertaining they are, I'd say this one beats it, but that one is a lot of fun as well. Now, the main version of this is all this not all that bloody and gory. There's a lot of fighting, including shooting, but it's really not anywhere near as bloody you know I, one of the last times I rewatched this was like the night before I went to watch went to see whatever went to the th the cinema for the first expendables movie and I had honestly forgotten you know the the stark difference between r rated you know 80s action movies and then like you know to be fair some of the 80s like robocop is quite uh, gory as well. Maybe the... And apparently, like, there is a version of this that is very violent, and you can kind of see how they they very awkwardly had to edit stuff out. They were not expect Like, it is it is very close to the level of, like, the... the um, Paul W. S. Anderson's... Ah, crap, what's it called? The, the movie about the volcano... Volcanic eruption. I'm I'm sorry, I forget what it's called, but he did only make the one, so you'll know what I'm talking about. That movie was very very clearly shot to be an R, and then very awkwardly edited. I I at least remember very specifically the opening of that movie has some stuff. I'm not sure I would say this one is quite as bad as that, but there's definitely like there's yeah there there are a couple of places in the film where it's like very awkwardly they, they had to trim something out and you can kind of see and, and I think it says in the on, on IMDb you can read the details about yeah now the tone is fairly comic booky you know Arnold is able to do ridiculous feats of strength and it, it fits really well it honestly it's kind of wild that he hasn't been in more comic book style movies but yeah you know because it really it he 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 fits this kind of thing just perfectly and i would say that the writing is unusually good for this kind of movie but the filmmaking itself is fairly generic it is really not a movie and you know before you say, ah, oh, but you know, no, there are movies that have a ton of action that are also incredibly well made, you know, and I, I would say that this has an unusually, you know, I, I don't know very many 80s movies that have this much action, but, you know, some, some 80s action movies that are better from a filmmaking perspective, even though they don't have as much action as this. You know, I, yeah, pretty much like Paul Verhoeven, you know, and, and thankfully they, you know, Paul Verhoeven, you know, directed Total Recall, which Arnie is in, and also fits perfectly into this, which also has some really ridiculous elements. So, but, but yeah, you know, so Arnold has gotten to be in some really well filmed, and, and yeah, Sorry, again, obviously, Terminator, you know, the, the, 
I guess most, really. Yeah, most of the Terminator movies, I can't quite say all of them, have very capable filmmaking, where here it is just, you know, yeah. But, but yeah, something like Robocop is a more effective film from a filmmaking perspective. Now... The, yeah, this, this movie has a lot of great moments of Arnold kicking ass, and if you at all like that kind of thing, this is definitely worth watching. Now... I, you know, before watching this the first time, I was worried that Cindy would be treated with very little respect, but... Yeah, I was pleasantly surprised to see she's an active character who contributes a lot. There are a lot of movies where she would just be the damsel in distress. And she would, you know, she's she's in part the comic relief, so she's kind of loud. And, you know, that can get annoying. But she's also, like, you know, she's not as bad as some 80s comic relief characters. And again, like, she, you know, there are several key moments of the film where she is literally indispensable. Like, she gets them out of situations that Arnold would not be able to get them out of. And, yeah, so before the first time I watched this movie, the action was definitely what I was looking most forward to, and the movie exceeded my expectations. And the numerous one-liners and general cheesiness is all, you know, also tremendously fun. Obviously, some people will like the movie less because of them. And for sure, like, if you... If you tell me that you... That you think the one-liners are bad, I'm sorry, I can't. That just... You're, we're speaking two different languages. But if you say that there is too many of them, an argument could be made. Because there's, like, there's a chunk of the movie where there's, like, a one-liner, like, every few minutes, sometimes several within almost, just, yeah. I don't think there are too many, but I could understand those who think that there are. And, you know, it's maybe also, I understand if some people are, like, Several of them are literally references to other movies, and it can be a little, like, there's a, there's a line between, like, the, the kind of thing where, you know, it's, it's ridiculous and out there and fun, and then, like, okay, this is, this is almost meta, and this is really not the kind of movie that's supposed to be meta, you know, so, yeah, and this is also, if you try to, you know, this is definitely a movie where you have to kind of ignore continuity errors because there are a lot of them, and some of them are just, like, bafflingly, like, I don't think they were, when, when, they, when they edited this, I don't think they cared about continuity. And some of it is also in the, like, in the planning and shooting. Like, there, there are a couple of times where... An object or a weapon will change very obviously between, like, a medium shot and a close-up. And it's very obvious that, like, one example is that there's this digital watch that John uses to make sure how much, you know, see how much time is left before... I suppose I shouldn't give away exactly, but yeah, the, the movie will make it clear. And in close-up, it's very clearly a digital watch because that, you know, that, but then when it's not a close-up, we still see him wearing it and it's very clear, I, I think the, the word is analog. And it's like, of course they didn't want him to wear a digital watch while he's doing all this, like, really risky stuff. Like, they don't want to pay to endlessly replace the digital watches, obviously. But it's still really obvious. It's still, like... 
distracting if you can't turn your brain off for that sort of thing. Now, I haven't watched the uncut version, but it sounds like it's very cool. If you can't get your hands on that, or it's like very expensive compared to, you know, it's fine to just watch the regular version. The regular version isn't like a neutered version of the, the movie, the way that some, like, there are movies out there where it's like, do not watch the the version that they, they you know, the, the one that's, excuse me. Make, you know, make sure you watch the, the proper version and not one that's trimmed for content or such because it really will take so much of the fun out of watching the movie. And I would definitely say the movie was well worth making. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you like this movie, I would say there are some people that are well worth, like, seeking out other work by... You know, and, and for some of them, they are still making movies, but, you know, the movie's 35 years old, so of course, not a lot of the people who worked on making it are still going to be, you know, anyway. But, obviously, if you like this movie, you'll probably like other Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff. I would say Steven E. D'Souza, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I should have looked it up. I'm sorry, dude. I love your work. I should have looked up how to pronounce your name. You know, he wrote the first two Die Hard movies as well, and just, I, yeah, he's he's a great writer. I really love the, the movie, the writing in the movies that he's written. I would also say that, you know, if you like this, you might like the sly version of Judge Dredd. Street Fighter with Jean-Claude Van Damme, which Steven E. D'Souza also directed. And... Obviously, Judge Dredd and Street Fighter are movies you really need to be in the mood for. And if you love the source material, you might find them to be very tough to watch. But if you can get into the exact thing they're going for, they're incredibly entertaining. And I warmly recommend this to any fan of Arnold Schwarzenegger and 1980s action flicks. And I give this a strong 8x Special Forces on a personal mission out of 10. And that brings us to the spoiler section where I get into the disclaimers. Now, if you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice via the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers, since a lot of it is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. Now, like I said, this for, from here on out, there are spoilers in this video. I do only intend to spoil this movie. If I spoil anything else, I will warn before I, you know, verbally warn before I do so, and I'll, like, hold up an index finger as I'm spoiling so that you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower the index finger. And, let's see. I, for those who care about that sort of thing, I might swear in this video. I might quote it and otherwise swear. And yeah, so the following is a short list supplied by the IMDb More Like This list of movies that are similar to this, some I think highly of, some I think very little of, that I might compare it to with, and you know, again, if I spoil anything from them, I will warn first. The Running Man, which I, excuse me, which to me is a 7 out of 10. True Lies, which is an 8. Predator, an 8. Eraser, a 6. Last Action Hero, an 8. Total Recall, an 8. Red Heat, 7. Kindergarten Cop, a 5. Conan the Barbarian, 7. Twins, which is a 6. And Conan the Destroyer, which is a 5. Now. So, yeah, from here on out, the rest of this video is not really a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC3K riff tracks and other jokes. 
And yeah, so the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The first section is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary or live tweeting or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. And the final section, again, it's stuff I think it is worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. Now, let's see, that is about. So, yeah, I sometimes try to look at whether a movie appears to have empathy for the least likable characters and whether I think they made the right choice. And, you know, this movie definitely does not have empathy for the bad guys. And I think it was the right choice. You know, I, this, this is not, you're not really supposed to think about, like, the deeper, you know, the, the bad guy is basically like a South American dictator. And the, yeah, the movie is just saying, you know, he's, he's a, he's a monster. There's no, there's nothing interesting to look at there. And yeah, this this is not the movie to go into what excuse me. Now let's see. Right, so yes, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative is in this video. I'm not sure I'm going to say very much negative, but if I do, it's not out of bitterness. I also do not feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, many of the things I say in this are for criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve. So. Now, I first watched this in the year 2006, and I I haven't really, I don't have an exact count of how many times I've watched it since somewhere between 5 and 10 before, you know, watching it right before hitting record. And, yes, so that brings us to... The next section. And for sure, there are some implausibility issues with the ways that Matrix's former squad mates are killed off. But at the same time, you know, those are some fairly clever ways they're you know they're these guys are not going to be on guard in the morning taking out the trash especially if they were surprised that it was on that day of the week or while selling a car at their job you know bill duke and the other guy very quickly kill and then get away from you know yeah from from the bodies before anyone really has much time to notice or do anything about it you know, as opposed to, like, let's say, trying to kill them in a really crowded place and then trying to get away without anyone. Yeah. I appreciate they do have a line about John originally being from East Germany, so they're not pretending he doesn't have an accent. Considering just how many movies frame men not taking no for an answer when it comes to an attractive woman, I really appreciate that in this movie, that kind of thing is something the bad guys do, and the woman is shown to dislike it, and get some good lines to shut him down, which even eventually works. I can imagine a lot of young women got young women got some helpful tips from this movie, and I really appreciate that. At first, Cindy really doesn't believe John, so instead of doing as he says and approaching Sully, she talks to a security guard. The movie is aware of how ridiculous the situation is. I mean, it also makes for an excuse for some more action, but still. You know, it wouldn't have been difficult for, like, let's say that she actually did, did believe him and goes to get Sully, and then Sully realizes and, like, you know, 
yells out help, and then the security guards come and attack John. I've seen some argue that John should talk to the security guards instead of fighting them off. I would argue that his thinking is they would have to report it. Word would get out, and the bad guys would realize what was going on, you know, long before, you know, and, and then kill Jenny long before the 11 hours was up. And that's if they would even help John. He doesn't actually have physical evidence. And before you say, well, he'll use his one call to talk to General Kirby, you know, if John thought that Kirby could help, he would have called him, you know, instead of going to talk to Cindy. And, you know, hypothetically, let's say that John went to the authorities. You know, Sully... Let's see. Oh, well, yeah, you know, Sully would probably keep, you know, like, keep an eye on, you know, make, make sure that, like, I don't know if he's got, like, a police radio monitor or something, but I'm not necessarily saying that that would be much use. I'm trying to say he would be keeping an eye on if someone was, you know, and if... Like, hypothetically, if John had only killed Sully, Cook, you know, Bill Duke's character, is, you know, he's going to show up to the motel room. Sully's not going to be there. Honestly, I can imagine the, ma the moment that Sully isn't there, Cook immediately calls, you know, Bennett or whoever and says, there's something wrong, kill Jenny, you know. You know, ba basically, Cook is the the extra, like, think about how easy it ultimately is to kill Sully and then, you know, not, it, you know, it might be, it might be a while before Cook finds out that Sully has been killed. Cook is there in case something happens to Sully, and John would, you know, figure that there's probably someone other than Sully. And obviously, the other guys are not going to tell John whether or not there is or who it is. You know, they, they just, the, the, you know, the, the, yeah. And then you have, let's see, that brings us to, yeah, so, you know, John would think of that sort of thing and Bennett has helped organize this whole thing. He knows that John would think of that sort of thing. And honestly, it probably is something you learn, you know, possibly even before, like, special forces kind of thing. You know, in, in the military. Now, let's see. Yeah. The movie has a very distinct message of not trying to work with kidnappers and such. You know, John shoots the guy in the cabin who says they need to work together. He... You know, once he takes the key from Sully, he kills him instead of talking to him for more information. He does try to get information out of Cook. You know, Cook ending up stabbed, you know, like that doesn't, you know, that wasn't how John wanted it to go. But, you know, like he keeps getting information by finding keys on people either right before or after killing them, which is actually very, very much like a video game. But the, I actually... I had forgotten the guy he kills in the cabin. That's not the first time we see that guy. That was he. He was he was you know when when Cook shot the guy who took out his garbage, he was the other guy shooting. So you know again we like I said in the review we've seen this guy be uh, you know a real bad guy. So, you know he's he's yeah this guy has. You know, is former military, so if he could shoot back, he might kill them. But they're still shooting a defenseless man. You know, the the you know, like hypothetically, if it were a western, they you know, there might be like they might throw a gun to the well, the bad guys wouldn't, but the you know, the 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 antihero, the protagonist, would throw you know a loaded gun over there so that he'd have a fair fair chance that, you know, but, yeah, and, and he's also, he's sitting there with the I love you daddy cars, or just, yeah, 
It's it's very very cathartic seeing John shoot him. I wonder how many stealth games took hints from this movie. I mean, once they're in that the the warehouse, John, you know, like he he knows wh where to go, so he sneaks there. Then he he realizes that a couple of people are gonna walk out the door, so he hides where they can't see him. Now if he tries to excuse me, if he tries to attack both, he might not be able to knock out both of them before either of them make a sound. Once they're, you know, once they can't see him, the, you know, he's out of their field of vision. He sneaks in, he stealth knocks out the guy in there, and then he hides the body in, in the, the, I don't know, broom closet or something, you know, so that the body won't be found as quick. Like, it really is, you know, the, the, It, it reminds me a lot of, for example, Hitman Blood Money. Obviously, it is pretty ridiculous that Bennett actually thinks that John will do what they want him to do, but to be fair, that is kind of a trope of the subgenre. The hostage takers always believe that the other person will do as they're told, instead of going rogue to try to free them, including when the hostage taker knows the person they're forcing very well. So, you know. I... Uh, yeah, there there are a lot of cases where that is true. There might be some where the where they realize it isn't, but and really at the end of the day, we wouldn't have a movie. You know, hypothetically, if they killed Jenny right away, then it's just kind of wow, the movie is that 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 a downer at that point. Sorry, my tongue rebelled, and and I didn't even kidnap its daughter. The, the, yeah, it's, it's, it, it would be really sad if, if the movie started with Jenny dying and then for the rest of the movie he's avenging her death instead, trying to, to get there in time to save her. I appreciate that the climax intercuts John killing all the soldiers with Jenny trying to escape and Bennett chasing after her, because at the end of the day, if there's no update on you know, how, if, if Jenny is still okay, then what's the point? Then it's just, you know, like meaningless, you know, meaningless noise, you know, it might still be fun to watch, but like the, the, you know, every time we see John kill someone, we really, you know, he gets closer to saving her and we all, we know that he only barely makes it before Bennett starts hurting her. You know, the fact that she's in danger in the climax, you know, it adds this sense of urgency that I've seen otherwise well-made action movies don't understand. It really is only at the very end that Bennett is no longer that intimidating where he's, you know, once he's confronted with Matrix in the climax. And really, during the fight, they are largely evenly matched. I don't know why... I and others, when we think of this movie, we're like, oh, you know, the villain is so weak, but really it's only very briefly there at the end. Yeah, and I'm not going to talk about the, uh, yeah, I'll get to that later. You know, he's, he's decent as being an intimidating presence for the rest of the movie. You know, he taunts John and he talks about how much of a badass John is without seeming scared of him. You know, it's really, it's his overly emotional reaction to John at the very end. And, and, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with, you know, not coming across as the, the toughest, but it just, it, you know, he's supposed to match Arnold Schwarzenegger in military skill. I don't know if the, the overly emotional and kind of coming across as weak, if they were, like, worried that the villain would end up cooler than Arnie. Honestly, it ends up feeling a little like an 80s Saturday morning cartoon villain, like afraid that its audience will find the bad guy character too scary and they'll get a bunch of angry phone calls from parents. You know, compare this villain to the one from the first Conan movie. I'm not going to spoil it. Also a movie starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and made, you know, what was it, 82? It was, it was not many years before this one, you know. 
or if you'll permit me to move beyond the 80s, you know, in 1991, the, the first Universal Soldier movie, you know, think of how fun Dolph Lundgren as the villain in that movie is, you know, one of the most memorable characters of that movie and of action movies in general, you know, imagine if every time we saw Bennett, he you know, I'm all ears. Uh-oh, nap time. You should have been taking your medication. You know, just, just so much more fun. And I, I think that that could, excuse me, I, I think it would have been, yeah. But, you know, to be fair, there are definitely other 80s action movies similar to this where the villain is just only okay and not incredible. Now, the movie... Yeah, the, I already mentioned that I didn't watch the, the un... You know, I watched the the most commonly known, not the, the restored version. It is an hour and 22 and a half minutes long without end credits and an hour and 25 and a half long with them. And it really... It knows not to overstay its welcome. It's it's exactly as uh, yeah. So that brings us to notes taken before watching. So yeah, I have not watched much else of the... Okay, Mark... Yeah, Mark L. Lester is the director of this. He also directed Firestarter. I really don't remember that as being particularly good. Which is too bad, because it's, it's a compelling concept. I think I heard somewhere that the book was pretty good, but I, I've read almost no Stephen King, so I wouldn't know. Now, let's see. But yeah, the story and the screenplay are by Stephen E. D'Souza. Again, apologies if that's the wrong pronunciation of, you know, the, the last name. Yeah, so he, the, the Running Man, Die Hearts 1 and 2, okay, Hudson Hawk is not all that good. And neither are, neither, you know, nor is the Flintstones movie. But, you know, Street Fighter and Judge Dredd also, just, yeah, he does such a good job. Judge Dredd also really benefits from the, the director. He really understands what tone to strike. And just, yeah. I, I forget his last name, but it's Danny, Danny Cannon, maybe? I, yeah, some something. And he is just, you know, he also directed, I still know what you did last summer. I know that movie is not as good as the first one. And I know some people don't like, you know, the first one either. But if you if you try to just adjust your expectations, it's a fun film. It's it's legitimately yeah. And yeah, the story is also written by Joseph Loeb the Third, who's only written three other movies. He's known for comic books, which may be part of why this film is so awesome. And I suppose I shouldn't give away which, but yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger has also starred in movies where some of his family members are killed early in the movie, and then the rest of it is like, you know, a revenge movie, and he does well in those as well, but it definitely is a very different movie, and I suppose, yeah, it's kind of a spoiler to give away. Let me just say that people looked at this sort of thing in a different way. Like, when this was made, like, I, I heard some, yeah, I think, uh, Lindsay Ellis brings up in her video on Stranger Things and other, like, nostalgia kind of stuff that's fairly recent that, you know, the more recent It movie, I haven't watched them, but apparently change it from, you know, originally it's that these kids are being killed and... In the new in movies, it's that kids are being kidnapped, which in the 80s was a thing. Kids were disappearing. 
I, I don't know how much it was kidnappings, but like every you know, yeah, the, you know that's that's where you have the the whole thing of like the the a child's face on on the side of a, a milk carton, you know. Yeah, a, a child had gone missing, and that so, you know that that plays to that, you know, and yeah, in the eighties it was appealing to see someone, you know, be able to get their kid back after someone takes them, and, yeah. Now, let's see. I did not realize until, like, researching for this video, I've actually watched most of Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies. And despite working for nearly 50 years, he's only been in 48 films. That's less than one per year on average. Like, there are, there are people who've been in way more. And, like... When you think of Schwarzenegger, it's like, oh, he's gonna, he must have been in a ton of movies, but no, ultimately not, yeah. And Ray Don Chong was also in The Color Purple and Quest for Fire. And if there was one person in Quest for Fire that just, like, if there was one actor that you could not replace, that nobody else could have done quite as good a job, it's her. You know, she is just perfect for that role. And she's a lot of fun in this as well. Now, let's see that brings us to... Yeah, so I watched a bunch of YouTube videos. Now, let's see... Yeah, Re Renegade Cut made a, a video, <sighs> I don't love that word, okay, um, yeah, um, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just, yeah, here's most of the video's title, Theory in 80s and 90s Action Movies, and, yeah, you know, Renegade Cut, points out some of the, you know, kind of, yeah, the, the, what was it he called it, homosocial stuff in, in, you know, Commando and other 80s and 90s action flicks. It's, it's, it's a great video. You know, I had watched it before, but, yeah, I felt like this was a good excuse to watch it again. In, in general, you know, Renegade Cut. Great videos. Now, I also watched... I'm probably going to get this wrong. De Decker Shado, I think, is how he pronounces it. He, you know, he says that the move, in this movie, Arnie has Seagal powers. And I haven't watched that much Seagal, and it's been years. I, I don't really know what Seagal powers means. And, you know, he, yeah, he points out, you know, why did Sully only have one quarter and he stole the second from Cindy? And he was so certain that what he got there was a quarter and not, you know, another, I forget what he said, an, another penny, maybe? I don't know. And he, you know, he says that Cindy screams too much since the filmmakers think it's hilarious. And he says, overall, it's, it's an okay movie. It's a decent presentation for good action set in an okay story. It's a Seagal movie with Arnie. And yeah, he, he made a really great video. I recommend you watch the entire thing. Now, yeah, and I watched Nostalgia Critics video on it. And he also, some of what he says make good points. And some of what he says shows that he did not pay full attention to the movie. And yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so that brings us to Outlaw Vern's review. So I'm going to, I'm just going to quote a few things from it. Again, I recommend you read the entire thing. You know, he says, you know, John lives in the woods with his daughter, Alyssa Milano. Who is the boss anyway? I never did figure that out. Luckily, before he gets too bored with this Snow White lifestyle. And, 
And to be honest, he looks more comfortable running around with camouflage paint on than he does feeding a deer. We all have our little things we're good at, you know? The fights are real good superpower type fights where they punch each other through the air and throw each other through walls. Right, and he points out that, you know, Predator is also better from Schwarzenegger, you know, better directed Schwarzenegger would be. And... Yeah, so... Right, and in the, com in the commentary section, comments section, sorry, Apparently, you know, yeah, back in 2010, they, they talk about this. Apparently, David Iyer was supposed to remake Commando. Yeah, that really... And someone puts a link to Commando the Musical, which is fun. And that brings us to the final section, which is called Critic Sites, MDB, and Wikipedia. So I have made some specific notes. I'm just going to go through. Some of this stuff I'm not going to get into. Let's see. Yeah, so this is a critic review. Comic book stuff helped out by the presence of Ray Don Chong as an airline stewardess whose sarcastic commentary and some comic. Counterpoint to the deliberately overscaled action. Right, and yeah, so from here on out, but yeah, from here and until I say otherwise, this is stuff from IMDb. And yeah, as usual, taglines if there's a mission that no man could survive, then he's the man for the job. They hunted him down, they murdered his friends. Now they've taken the one thing he would kill for, his only daughter. May heaven help them. Let's party. Somewhere, somehow, someone's going to pay. And yeah, so this is IMDb trivia. According to Alyssa Milano, Arnold Schwarzenegger was very protectful of her onset. He even helped with my algebra homework. And Ray Don Chong nailed her audition and was given this role on the spot. She took it saying, I knew Arnold would make the film a hit, and I wanted to be part of that. Arnold Schwarzenegger and Vernon Wells, who plays the villain, have, you know, uh, Bennett, have remained close friends ever since making the making of the movie. 
and Ray Donchon's reactions to the motel fight were filmed separately and were completely ad-libbed. So, you know, her saying, I can't believe this macho bullshit, and these guys eat too much red meat, were ad that's that's really great. It's, yeah, she really had a sense for when when making this movie. I don't I don't think she's done it. I'm not trying to refer to her in the past tense. I'm saying when she was making this movie, she had a real great sense of what lines would work perfectly with the, the tone. Schwarzenegger and Chong shot a love scene, but it was deemed unconvincing and was dropped from the movie. I, I agree. I don't think that would really make sense for the... Yeah... And the body count is 109. Excuse me, 102 of them are killed by, excuse me, by Arnie. 109. And the movie is 90, what was it, 92 and a half. So that's more than one person per minute on average. So, yeah. There are 54 stunt performers listed in the credits. 17 more people than the actual cast. And... Arnie performed many of his own stunts, as producers found it difficult to find a stunt double for the bodybuilder. Yeah, not very many people have his body, that is. Nick Nolte was the original choice for John Matrix. Don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not comparing today Nick Nolte to 1985 Nick Nolte. I like 1985 Nick Nolte a lot. I think he gave some great performances in the 80s and 90s, but boy, would he not be the right choice for this. Wow, that is unreal. Arnie can bench press over 450 pounds, but they made the film with out of balsa wood anyway. Wow. According to Stephen E. Kazusa, Arnold Schwarzenegger told him, I like this picture. I'm not a caveman. Before the shooting and killing, I'm a normal person. This is director Mark L. Lester's favorite movie of his own. And John McTiernan was offered the chance to direct this film and turned it down. And later, while editing Nomads, his feature debut, he was offered the chance to direct Schwarzenegger's second film for Trans Century Fox, Predator, which he accepted. And he also directed Arnie in Last Action Hero. Now, let's see. This film came out the same year as the similarly themed Rambo First Blood Part 2, starring Sylvester Stallone. Both films performed well at the box office though Stallone's film was a much bigger hit and cultural global phenomenon. The fact that Stallone and Schwarzenegger had competing films out in the same year fueled the Stallone vs. Schwarzenegger rivalry that went on for years, both with each other and in the media. The introduction to Matrix as he comes out of the forest with close-ups on his boots, chest, biceps, etc., was shot and edited in a similar fashion as Lenny Riefenstahl's Nazi propaganda movies. According to director Mark L. Lester, this was done to represent the notion of the invincible man of the earth emerging from the forest. I mean, it definitely is a memorable aspect. Excuse me. 
I didn't bring it up because I talk about it in my old videos, which will be linked in the description box on this movie. Winona Ryder, Shannon Doherty, Elizabeth Shue, Drew Barrymore, Jennifer Connelly, and Patricia Arquette all auditioned for the role of Jenny. Let's see, Winona Ryder, so this would have been around the same time as Beetlejuice. Yeah, I, I don't think she would have been as good for the role as Alyssa Milano. Alyssa Milano, she's got that smile, like she's very girl next door, or at least was when she was like a, you know, back then. I think, you know, maybe her type changed once, you know, once she became an adult and 20-something, 30-something. But, yeah, back then, you know, and I have not seen Shannon Doherty in something from, um, I don't think I've seen anything that she's in other than Charmed. So I would not know, you know, the 13 years between this movie coming out and Charmed for, you know, the, the first episode of Charmed airing, so. And let's see, Elizabeth Shue. Wasn't Elizabeth Shue? Let's see, I forget if, I feel like she was in either she was in, in at least one of the Back to the Future movies. Wouldn't she be a little tall for the... I, I, I'm not sure she that there's a huge age difference between her and Alyssa Milano, but Alyssa Milano really wasn't... I'd actually forgotten, but she's apparently like 13 when they filmed this. You know, she doesn't look... But anyway, yeah, you know, she's, she's tiny, you know, and that works really well for the movie. Now, let's see, Drew Barrymore, I could maybe see that, yeah. Jennifer Connelly, I, I suppose, I don't know, I feel like she, yeah, I don't know, I, I think Alyssa Milano was absolutely perfectly cast. Let's see, Jennifer Connelly, this would be around the same time as Once Upon a Time in America. She's great in that. I don't... Now, I, I don't think she would have been as... Patricia Arquette, I have not seen in anything from the 80s. So I would not be. Now, after Cindy fires the rocket launcher, she says she learned how to use it because she read the instructions. While the line was intended as a joke, if you look closely in the earlier scene when she and Matrix stock up at Surplus City, there is indeed an instruction manual for the weapon in the shopping cart, as Cindy wheels the cart out of the store. Originally, the studio execs didn't want Arnold Schwarzenegger to talk at all in the movie. And as, you know, yeah, the trivia, further note, this would have been a real loss, as Arnold Hilari Arnold's hilarious one-liners would have been sorely missed. I'm not gonna lie, if he didn't talk, like, I'm sorry, is Cindy still in the movie? So he just, like, glares at her and, like, point, what is, what is he, con I'm not, I'm not mocking sign language. I'm just saying I don't think that would work for this movie. If he was communicating with her non-verbally, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't see that at all. But I guess the studio execs didn't want the accent or something. Like how originally he went by Arnold Strong instead of Schwarzenegger. And then once he became famous, it was like, nope, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, you know, no, nobody is like, ah, oh, this is like, it's hard to spell his name for sure, his, his last name. But yeah, that's, that's his name. That's, now... This is the second of three films in which Bill Paxton and Arnold Schwarzenegger work together, the other two being The Terminator and True Lies. And I think I read that apparently Arnie recommended, you know, like he talked to the, you know, the director or producer or something and said, you know, Bill Paxton, you know, you should give him a role. And that's really cool. Like, Arnie, he's such a great friend. Like, that's, you know, there, there, there are, tons of people who would not have done that but yeah like the 
they enjoyed working together on the Terminator. So it was like, you know, there's it's not a huge role, but he's there. You know, it got him a little exposure. He has several lines, and I, I think he does a, a decent job. Like he he care he's supposed to carry a little authority and like, you know, I mean he's he's literally sitting there saying if you don't, you know, oh, let me think, what was it? They're supposed to land. I, I'm sorry, I forget. But uh, are they supposed to land the plane? As opposed to sky the plane. I, I forget. But, you know, it, and he says, or you will be fired upon. You know, so that has to be, you know, so so he can't play it, you know, he can't be like, game over, man. He, he has to be the, the more serious kind of, I like Bill Paxson. It really, really sucks that, yeah, R.I.P. Now, let's see. This is kind of, okay. The final battle was filmed at the Harold Lloyd Estate in Beverly Hills, built by the famous silent film star. An intensely superstitious man, Lloyd would never drive around the circular fountain at the front of the house, believing, sorry, I briefly turned Canadian there at, at the front of the house, believing it would bring bad luck. In this film, the villains drive around the fountain and suffer massive misfortune the next day when Matrix attacks them. That's that's such a great that yeah. That's probably not even intentional, but like someone realized, oh hey. Mark L. Luster called the film the quintessential 80s action film and granddaddy of the genre. Screenwriter Jeff Loeb originally wrote the script with the intention of having Gene Simmons play Matrix. Now, I only know Gene Simmons from Runaway, so that I don't think that Gene Simmons would have worked as John Matrix, but yeah, that's that's very interesting. And and then you know later Loeb rewrote the script with Nick Nolte in mind. It's an out of condition former commander. Now, let's see. Predator, 1987, reunited producer Joel Silver and actors Arnie and Bill Duke, all of whom worked together on this film. Yeah, I, you know, this. I think this. This is worth pointing out. The scene where John, where yeah, John and Cook are fighting in the motel room. They break into the room next door where there is a naked couple in bed. A video camera on a tripod can be seen on the far left, pointed right at the bed. So this is not just a couple having sex. This is like, they're making a porno, and it's it's just, it's such a wild detail that someone like. This is not like, oh, someone forgot to move the camera prop. No, no, no. They specifically, and it is kind of like, if you if you aren't paying very close attention, you might not even notice that it's there. It's the, the cam, the, the movie doesn't highlight that it's there. No one comments on it, but it's, it's there. The, the, this movie depicts a scene in which a couple are making a, like a homemade porno, basically. Because, you know, it's not like there's, any other film crew there, so it's like, actually, wait, does that make it sex tape? No, I guess back then it would have been amateur porn. Today it might be called a sex tape, but yeah, that's it's such a such a wild detail that just yeah. Director Mark L. Lester initially wanted. Okay, I I'm gonna try. I think it's pronounced Raúl Julia, because like the. Yeah, I don't know. For the role of Ares, but producer Joel Silver insisted on casting Dan Hedaya. I feel like Roe would have been a perfectly fine fit for the role. 
Writer Stephen E. D'Souza later wrote Street Fighter, also his directorial debut, and Julia starred in this film. So, you know, the, the, yeah, that is really, and, and he's so much fun in that film. Just the, yeah, I feel like quoting him, but, yeah, I, I should, I should resist the temptation. You know what he sounds like. And if you don't, you have got to at least watch a clip. You are definitely missing out if you haven't watched at least clips of his performance in that movie. And I would definitely recommend watching the entire movie. Again, you have to be in the right state of mind for it, or you might hate it, but in the right state of mind. You know, I, I'm not saying that just any movie, that, like, I don't know that there is a right state of mind to enjoy Conan the Destroyer. I, I, or... Red Sonia. I, I'll agree that there are things you can laugh at, and that can be enjoyable for the movie, but on the whole, they're just not that... No, they're, they're, not, they're not ironically enjoyable, and they're not properly, unironically enjoyable either. Yeah, I think the words came out right. Yeah, and this points out that, you know, Matrix says wrong when he shoots and kills Diaz, and in The Terminator, Arnie also says wrong when he shoots and kills the, the gun shop clerk. And that, you know, I, I mentioned in the review that some of the one-liners are, you know, the, they're references. You know, he also says, I'll be back, Bennett. And, I mean, I guess technically when he says, trust me, ah. Uh, should I give away because it's late in that movie? Okay, what I'll, all I'll say is that is in another Arnie movie, but one that came out after this. So I guess it's that other movie that's referencing this movie. But but yeah, you know, there's... Are those then? I'll be back. Wrong. Trust me. Yeah, that might be. But, but you know, I... In three alternate takes of Bennett's death scene, Matrix says different lines. I hate small talk. I think it was too much pressure for you, Bennett, and couldn't take the pressure, Bennett. Honestly, I feel like the those latter two are better than the one, you know, let often see in Bennett. I don't know. I've, it's okay, but I, I think pressure lines are, I don't know. Now, let's see. Vernon Wells later starred in the futuristic prison flick Fortress, which takes place in 2017. I will do videos on both of the Fortress movies. But there are, I think they're a little bit down the line. But yeah, I have both on DVD and I, I love that first one. And the second one... Wow, it could have been a lot better, but it's it has some cool stuff. Arnold, yeah, Arnie was originally cast as the film's main protagonist, John Brennick. Christopher Lambert was cast instead when Arnie passed on it to do Last Action Hero. Oh boy, I he probably wishes he had done Fortress instead. Although both are considered cult classics. Last time I watched Last Action Hero, I really loved it, and... Let's see, not next week, but the week after that, I intend, if nothing goes wrong, I intend to do a video on Last Action Hero. But, I, you know, maybe I was in a, just in a really, you know, in a really good mood when I watched it. I don't remember if it's, I, I can't say right now if it's good. I had Arnie accepted, it would have made the first of two times that he played a prison inmate in the year 2017. The other was The Running Man, which came out in 1987, so it imagined it as 30 years. And Fortress imagined it 25 years later. Excuse me. He did do a prison movie, didn't he? But was that 7, 20, excuse me, 17? He, he did that one with Stallone. Escape Plan or something? I haven't watched it. I haven't watched very many of Arnie's more recent ones. 
Arnie agreed to do the movie because he wasn't playing a caveman nor a robot and wouldn't be walking around in their clothes and that he would be playing a normal person. Let's see. I mean, Conan isn't a caveman, but I guess, I don't know. Just, you know, if that's how he sees it, that's fine. I, th I think he's incredible as Conan. In, in Conan the Barbarian, I... I don't remember if he's also not that good in Conan the Destroyer. I just remember that the movie overall isn't good. It's been so long. Right, yeah, the, the fuck you asshole, that's also what he says in, you know, yeah, in, in The Terminator he also says fuck you asshole, so. Right, and there's also, I forget if that's a spoiler or not, so I won't be saying. Yeah, this one notes, yeah, yeah, never mind. I was about to say this one says, no, but this one notes, you know, one of the punks says it to Arnie and the Terminator, and then he later says it, no later, yeah. But the, yeah, like that, the, the, uh, let me think. There's the thing, um, is it Bill Paxton? I, I don't remember if Bill Paxton's the one who says it in The Terminator. The only movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Bill Paxton that did not involve James Cameron. The goof section lists 155 continuity errors. So once again, the movie is 90, 92 minutes. So that's an average of what, one and a half continuity errors per minute? Yeah, that's, yeah. Now, let's see. Some of the goofs... I, I'm not sure I'm going to argue with any of them, but some of them, it's just, the, it's funny the way they wrote them. So I'm just going to, yeah. The police are marching Matrix out of the gun shop. They didn't even put handcuffs on him. I think I would put handcuffs on a guy who just smashed open a gun shop and was stealing all the guns he could, in, get, he could get into his hands. Yeah, that's... And, and this, this is also quite funny. The air stairs at Valverde Airport say "Era Servicio, which is an incoherent word-for-word -word translation of air service into Spanish. Translated back into English, it would mean something like service, skies. The correct translation would have been Servicio Aero. E -e 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 -e. You know what? I am not going to subject you to any more of my pronunciation of Spanish words than absolutely necessary. I, that is a promise that I made my Spanish teacher. She made me swear on a Bible too. Let's see. Matrix, an ex-commando, ignorantly thinks ramming the bulldozer through the wall of an army surplus store wouldn't trigger some kind of alarm. At the end, where Matrix kills Bennett by throwing a pipe through him. Okay, sure, but let's just pretend. The pipe goes through Pen Bennett and into a steam pipe behind him. Then steam pours out of the pipe that Matrix threw. Now what happened to all the flesh, bone, skin, and blood that was inside of the pipe? So again, that's a very... I didn't add anything to that. That's how the goof is written. That's, yeah. This one... This one is just golden. I, I, I love this one so much. On Matrix and Cindy's way flying to an island 
to rescue his daughter, they flew west. Yet prior to arriving at the island, the sun was seen rising. Did they travel around the world? If the guy who wrote that is watching this, just... That's that's excellent. That's so good. That please write more goofs. You your your service is not going unnoticed. That was that was brilliant. Let's see. During the long shootout at the compound, Arnold shoots down a whole army of bad guys. When he reaches the fountain, he shoots at about three or four people from a bird's eye view. If you watch closely, you can see one of the guards dive on the ground and play dead before Arnold's stream of bullets reaches him. Given what was happening at the time, that may not have been a bad idea. When Matrix is in the gun shop, you see him take the missile launcher off the wall, but then in another scene, it is back on the wall again. Also, watch how easily Cindy runs with this missile launcher to the shopping cart. I guess those things don't have any weight to them. During the shooting scene at by the mansion, the same poor soldier gets killed from different angles again and again and again dot 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 dot. That's yeah. Again, I really enjoy when they, <laughs> like, I think originally the idea was that these are supposed to be written, like, professionally, like, very, with a, with a neutral tone, you know, but I really like it when they, when they have a very clear voice in there. Around 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 11 seconds, during explosions, we see that men are in fact mannequins because they didn't move. How is it that the two cops in the paddy wagon are incapacitated by the rocket, but Matrix is able to walk away unscathed? I realize it's Arnold, but... and then dot 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 dot. I'm sorry, this is just, this is kind of funny. Cindy calls the plane amphibian. The correct term is amphibious. I think amphibian is the species name, so like, I don't know. I guess she thinks that it's, <laughs> it's a, what, what is, isn't that what they also call lizards? Amphibians? Yeah. So that would have made for a very different scene if, if they got on the back of a giant lizard and flew away. When Cindy asks, what did you do with Sully, surely she must have known he'd been dropped off the cliff as she was standing about five meters away. It, that is kind of true. It's, yeah. And, let's see. I mean, this isn't really a goof. This is listed as miscellaneous, and then it says, it's never revealed what Bennett did to get kicked out of Matrix's unit. I mean, maybe you wish it was in the movie, but that's not a goof. That's not a problem with the movie. And, yeah, and this is incorrectly regarded as goofs. Matrix, after pulling Sully from the Porsche, practically shouts his name very clearly. Cindy was about 20 feet from them, but could have clearly made his name out. That makes sense. Now, let's Yes, yeah, that was all that I had noted to make sure to save.
Let's see, is there anything that I want to say as a final sort of... On the, on the back of the cover, yeah, I'm just gonna, in this Arnold classic, Arnold is in quotes and capitalized. And yeah, and the rest of it's just a, it's, it's just the, the plot summary. It's not really, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna briefly show the the cover, and then that will be. Yeah, let me let me briefly see. Okay, so yeah, I already mentioned that. Like, I think some games took inspiration from this. I already mentioned the so stealth game. You know, I think I think for sure. You know, in addition to Hitman Blood Money, I think the there's some inspiration. You know, some some stuff from this that ended up in the Commando games. You know, the the real time strategy stealth games. You know, from the bird's eye view, for sure. There's a certain resemblance. You know, yeah. The the one of the characters there is a green beret, and while it's not said that uh, John Matrix is, you know, the, the Cook's character is said, and and. You know, his face is all... He doesn't look that much like Arnold specifically, but they both have these, like, you know, faces that look, like, sculpted. Like, you know, the, the look... They, they look tough from, from their face, you know. And, yeah, so there's... And, and the, you know, the Green Beret is especially good with his knife, which... You know, in this, yeah, John is great with that knife. I think that is everything. It's too bad that there isn't a sequel, but at the same time, it does stand on its own really well. Let's see. I don't, I wouldn't necessarily be against a remake i think that if they make a remake it should definitely be r i really don't think this movie would pack anywhere near the punch it does without squibs without swearing you know and i think that i i don't really think there's much point in making a remake and then like making it super realistic, for example, or completely changing. Like, hypothetically, I don't know if Arnie would still do it, but, like, I haven't seen The Rock in very much, but I could imagine he could do, you know, a, a good job and just, you know, polish the script slightly more, maybe some of the, maybe a little bit more characterization for, for example, John, and, you know, yeah, I, I think you could make close to the the same we just don't don't make it like realistic but you know today a lot of action movies are getting made that you know are not that realistic so yeah yeah that is all i have to say so the reason i only show movie covers here at the end of videos is that sometimes excuse me the autofocus really does not, excuse me, do a good job of focusing, you know, yeah, adjusting the focus to me. And honestly, if you're not focusing on me, I don't know, they're doing something wrong with your life. You know, so, yeah, just so that the video isn't like hugely out of focus from start to finish. But if you haven't, if you don't have a physical copy or you haven't just, or, or you know, maybe there's more than one cover, it's, if you like this movie at all, I think this is a really awesome cover for it, you know, that's, yeah, and then here on the back you've got him with the rocket launcher and you've got a smaller picture of the, yeah, John and Bennett, you know, about to fight each other, both with a knife in their hand, so that's really cool. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching the recording, and I will catch you next time.